So thank you, Christian. Thank you, John, for the invitation. Uh, thank you to uh, my students, Omar, Yulia, Walter, and Marcus, uh, who did uh, a lot of the work here. Um, and this basically is uh, a lot of what uh, you'll be seeing can be found in this very recent paper that uh, appeared in, in February on control of attentional processes and vision. So I guess the, the first thing I really would have to talk about is why think about attentional control? Uh, I'm a vision guy. I've been working on attention for a long time, but, and after 20 years, uh, our selective tuning model of visual attention kind of seemed mature. Um, and if I believe in it, it means that I believe that it's actually playing a real role in an intelligent agent, whether it be human or, or artificial. And we hadn't really explored any of that those connections and we wanted to do so. Selective tuning defines attention as a set of mechanisms that dynamically tune visual processing to the task uh, and input at hand. Uh, there are three major types, selection, suppression, and restriction. And within there, there's 19 different mechanisms that we've uh, identified so far. Um, it's made a, a pretty strong um, a set of predictions uh, and uh, with uh, uh, with great evidence, uh, experimental evidence, this doesn't just explain things, it predicts new knowledge. And you can see uh, a nice talk by uh, the neuroscientist uh, Max Hopf uh, at the link that I give you there that explains uh, some of the experimental work behind all of this. So we hadn't previously, had previously addressed any of these connecting issues, as I mentioned. However, we know that lots of other people have. So we sat down and we looked at the literature, which is very large and very difficult to try and and uh, put together, but uh, so we came up with a, you know, one way of trying to partition uh, the literature um, as is shown in this uh, Venn diagram uh, of different kinds of, um, of how people really have expressed their models. Um, this represents a very broad spectrum of thought. We wanted to cover all the different disciplines that were relevant. Uh, most of these try to explain some constellation of observations. They start with data. Others try to produce similar behavior, but again, start with the data and top-down approaches seemed a little bit uncommon. Recently in the ones that are highlighted uh, in yellow, uh, you see that the ideas of flexible coordination and dynamic recruitment make uh, multiple appearances. Uh, and this was mentioned yesterday in yesterday's talks as well. Attentional mechanisms play a role in many of these, but certainly not with the breadth of abilities that humans have shown. And we did, uh, uh, Yulia Kotsaruba and I have a, a paper that um, reviews cognitive architectures over the past 40 years and shows that although yes, attention is there, it's really not there with the same sort of, uh, of breadth. So we decided to take, uh, to go away from a data-driven kind of an approach. It's data informed, we certainly care about the data, uh, but we'll take a top-down approach. And just as a quick reminder, even though the name Mar has been mentioned uh, already uh, today. Uh, these are uh, David Marr's famous levels of analysis, and we're really interested in the computational one only. Uh, a much less famous level of analysis is the one that I added to it in 87, uh, the complexity level, um, where we want to stress that any theory must be realizable under the, 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 the real world resource constraints uh, where it must operate. Uh, something that uh, Olaf was uh, complaining about yesterday too. Um, but, you know, even though, uh, you know, we looked through all of this and we've looked at all of these papers and done these reviews, we kind of realized that we really didn't know what the problem was that we wanted to solve under attentional control. We wanted to connect up our attentional model to an agent, but like, well, how? So we need an example. So uh, I'll, uh, some of you will figure out what this title is all about uh, very quickly as soon as I start my example. Um, in 1997, I drove my daughter to a ballet workshop. Later that day, I returned to pick her up. On entering the workshop hall, I saw about 100 young girls all milling about and chatting or playing as they waited for their parents, all wearing exactly the same dance outfit, all with their hair in the same style, all roughly the same height and age, and surprisingly, more girls had the same skin and hair color. I scanned the area as I entered the room, but even my familiarity with my daughter's face did not make it pop out from the crowd. At this point, I thought it would be great to show you a picture of my daughter's class. I then rethought that and realized it didn't have to 
because Edgar Degas had already faced the same problem in his famous uh, Impressionist painting, The Dance Class. So you see, this is the problem that I had. They were all dressed the same. They all looked very much the same. How to find my daughter? I panicked. I started moving through the room, looking at faces one by one, asking, is this my daughter's face? No luck. Then I realized that some faces were not visible. So I started to walk around to get different viewpoints. Of course, I eventually found her and all was well. But the question is, how did I do this? Like exactly what, what was going on for me to be able to figure out this particular sequence of actions in order to find my daughter? So I thought this was a very uh, ecologically valid and completely realistic everyday sort of an experience. Uh, again, things that uh, were mentioned in the talks yesterday about, about experimental work. So I started asking questions about whether or not this problem is a difficult problem. I certainly felt it was difficult when I was doing it. So is generating behavior from visual input computationally difficult? The answer is yes. I've been writing about it for 30 years. And there's a retrospective paper uh, in 2017 that I can point you to. But it's not just me who says this. Uh, there's a really nice paper by Iris Van Roy in Cognitive Science from uh, 2008, where she uh, actually uh, categorizes large numbers of problems uh, and, and proofs of their difficulty beside them. And I show you that uh, on the side there. Uh, what the proofs do is highlight that an exact, correct, and optimal solution that can apply for all problem instances is unlikely. They all hit the complexity wall, which basically means that they don't scale well uh, with input. Okay, So as a little sidebar, uh, available computing resources recently have increased uh, so dramatically, especially in the past decade, that people can now solve Practical uh, problems for practical input sizes. That doesn't change the inherent formal properties of these problems. It just means that you can solve larger instances of them. And that's all. The only viable strategies for being able to, so to actually solve the problem for all of the instances is that you can't solve the problem with a single method. You need to be able to either only approximate everything or you solve special classes or you have some combination of strategies. And basically this leads you to the fact that you need to decide on subsets of problems that you can solve with separate algorithms. So the problem needs to be reframed. I'll add to it generating rational behavior, whether or not that's a difficult problem because a rational agent has a purposeful behavior. I had to find my daughter, I had a purpose. And they act consistently with their models and to, to achieve the goals. And this is where control comes in. Behavior inconsistent with rational behavior means the agent is out of control. A controller could then move it back towards its goal-directed pathway. And we come back to Iris's list here because detecting progress towards a goal is no easier than anything else that I've mentioned. The subtasks like categorization or visual search are just as combinatorially difficult as the original goal and any subsequent replanning, again, is as difficult as the original planning task. So what, this, what does this tell us? That tells us that the problem needs to be reframed and a single unified method is not the right answer, uh, with apologies to the previous speakers and others. Uh, <laughs> the starting point really is that you need to take the set of all po uh, uh, possible problem instances and partition it. You can define the problem in any way you like. You include the stimulus, the desired behavior, a set of constraints, and those constraints can include the timing of a response, what our resources are available, what acceptable error is. And for each of those different subclasses, you seek acceptable algorithms. So there will be a set of algorithms. Now, what does this look like? So I published this in 2017. This is a particular decomposition of visual tasks of many different kinds of visual tasks. Many of them are classic uh, psychophysical uh, experimental paradigms, so they're well understood. It doesn't matter if you agree with this, disc, de, uh, with this, this um, decomposition, and it does not matter if it's correct. What, it, what matters is that it exists, that their problems are decomposed, and the effectiveness of this de decomposition will then be dependent on the algorithms that are associated with each subclass. So one of those is same different, as you see there. Uh, so just keep that in mind because we'll be coming back to that. 
Rational behavior is difficult to generate, but is, it is, is its control necessary? Many answers have been suggested. One answer is no, because it emerges. We heard this yesterday. But then how can you cor have corrective ad action to it if you don't know exactly what will be emerging at any one time? You can't monitor and replan if it's emergent. Feed forward processes suffice. No, the timing is different. You go all the way through the brain once and many problems take longer than, than that at all. The observed timing doesn't fit. Passive heart ride system is all that's needed. But then how do you do active observation? There's sufficient brain uh, machinery for brute force. Combinatorics of data, not the quantity, are far too great. It's combinatorics that matter. Appropriate learning strategies can learn rational behavior. Space of all possible behaviors is too large to prevent, to permit you to have a statistically valid training set. So that means the answer is yes, because Commander Spock says so. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So that's my particular direction. So we're gonna look at the problem in a little bit more detail of same different. Are two objects the same? This is an everyday sort of task. You do it in lots of different contexts. What we're going to do is push this to the extreme in order to try and discover its characteristics. So we're really trying to solve what is the sequence of actions to correctly determine if two objects are the same. This is one of Iris's problems in her list. It's computationally intractable to do similarity. So it's a tough problem uh, to begin with, but it will help us understand exactly what attentional control might need to solve equal interest for human as well as robot, robot behavior. When I was looking for my daughter, I was an active observer in the three-dimensional world. Human and animal systems did not evolve looking at images on flat surfaces while sitting in a chair. If you found a nice red cherry to pick, you certainly are not going to eat it until you look at the reverse side to make sure that it actually won't make you sick. We look through the literature, this is not active observation in the 3D world is not a well-studied problem. So we set up our own experimental facility in order to do this. Uh, we call it PISAO. It's, uh, you see a little uh, a bird's eye view on the right-hand side there uh, of the training area um, and uh, uh, where, we where we have cameras and so forth. Uh, remember these uh, yellow triangles that show starting start long side start corner and start um, the uh, uh, short side and that there are two posts here okay so just remember that because you'll see that again in addition we have uh, an optotrack system that tracks your head we have toby pro glasses that will track your glade uh, your gaze we added custom markers to the glasses so now we can synchronize head with gaze and we have uh, the ability to record accurate to microsecond uh, level uh, gaze and head position uh, of, uh, of a subject. So what we want subjects to do now is to look at these sorts of objects, which are, you know, if you look at uh, the L1 objects, you can think of constructing such things out of Legos. They're, you know, from simple to very complicated. Uh, the paper shows, gives you files so that you can 3D print your own if you like. But basically, these are now some pretty complicated objects. If I ask you, are they the same or different? It's not always trivial to be able to tell the difference. So we set them up uh, on these posts in our experimental uh, area. And this is, a, a you see here, a visualization, the first person view and a, a third person view. I'll just run the video so you can see the experiment actually proceeding. So a subject comes into, uh, into the area and just and has to answer the question, are these same or different? Uh, in the top uh, left corner, you see the, the viewing uh, frustum for each of these uh, views as the subject moves about. And it's all being recorded. So now we have all this data of what a subject actually looks at as they're moving about. I think you get the picture. I'm pretty sure I can just stop and just move on. So our progress to date on this is that we've recorded 66 subjects. We have 1,200 trials, and a trial looks like this. This is kind of getting scary if you think about it from the perspective of how am I going to analyze all of this? You see here, uh, there are two objects. They're in um, red and cyan. 
And each of the viewing frusta for, for each object is shown in its color. And you see the dotted line is where the subject's head was moving. And for some of these, you see exactly what they're looking at. The little red circle in the little images shows you where gaze is centered. So we now have 1,200 of these, and then COVID happened. We need to get a few more. But we've already been able to get quite a few very interesting observations. So for example, uh, accuracy is very high. People can do this task, even though those look dif those difficult. Average accuracy is almost 94%. Um, and if you start on the long side, uh, where you see both objects directly in front of you, you're better at it than if you start where one object is behind the other object. Error responses take more time and require more fixations. The average number of fixations is 93. So, and the average length of a trial is 48 seconds. So if you take 300 milliseconds per fixation change, that leaves you over 20 seconds for thinking. What is, are you thinking about? That's where all of the issues regarding to attentional control, the connections to memory and so forth must come in. And that's what we'd like to be, eventually be able to figure out. So looking at these traces, uh, Marcus Solbach, the student whose PhD this, uh, this will be, uh, also interviewed all the subjects. So the subjects told them, you know, well, this is what we think we were doing. And he also did some sequence pattern mining in all of those in order to come up with a set of uh, strategies that are being applied. And they include things like you know, obvious strategies, divide and conquer, work course to find, find an outlier, take alternating views of a different object, and, and so much more in terms of, of all of those details that uh, I won't go into um, for the moment. Um, but when you put all of these together amongst these 90 or so fixations, uh, you get these traces that look like this. This is impossible for you to read, I understand. But I wanted to give you a feel for the level of complexity that, these, that solutions to this task take. So these are three different kinds of scenarios uh, amongst the 1,200 trials that we have. Uh, and and I, I hope you can appreciate the fact that this is far from easy to try and deal with. I'll turn one upside down uh, on its, uh, sorry, right side up and give you a little bit of a blow up for them so that you can see a little bit about what's going on. And what you see is that they're kind of alternating uh, strategies that uh, try to find outliers by changing your viewpoint multiple times from object to object uh, and doing divide and conquer and so forth. So when, you, when I looked at these the first time, they reminded me a lot more of things like planning and execution monitoring and real planning, replanning in AI. And they involve a lot of complex methods. So from our perspective, I think we now have found our example. This is where this all started, is we were looking for what example is it that will be able to really test what the elements of attentional control are for our attention model and its interactions with memory and and other components. So as a result, we developed, we uh, proposed this uh, architecture that we've called STAR, the Selective Tuning Attentive Reference Model. And we have uh, a pretty rich uh, set of work already on the visual hierarchy and fixation control and on attention itself, uh, and are just beginning to work on uh, many of the others. The only other one that I'll tell you a little bit about is the cognitive programs, because these kinds of complex patterns are begging for what, how to represent these. So what we thought of is the idea, uh, uh, we're motivated by the idea Shimon Ullman had, uh, the classic idea of a visual routine, which has found uh, a lot of um, uh, neurophysiological evidence as well as cognitive. And there's just a summary of the way uh, Shimon defined them. When you look at this, you have to ask yourself, well, the our understanding of visual processing has moved very far beyond what Marr had written in 1982. And our understanding of attention has moved very far beyond the saliency map of Koch and Ullman. So our cognitive programs can be thought of as an updated version of visual routines, where they deal with the full breadth of vision as we currently understand it, as well as 
of uh, attention. Many of the other elements are very similar, except now just upgraded in order to be able to handle uh, the variations that um, a modern view of how vision proceeds and how attention proceeds uh, can go. So attentional control for us then has at least the following kinds of tasks. Some method is required to choose which is uh, the, uh, uh, from the set of all the defined algorithms applies to the current instance. So some way of recognizing the current instance. And you can then, as you see from these traces uh, of, of actual experiments, you make mistakes often. Second task, it might be that no single algorithm is available, in which case a sequence of algorithms needs to be found. And this is the, this kind of points to the old means ends analysis that we saw back from Newell and Simon in 61, uh, where you try something and then you use the new result uh, and, and the new changes in order to try something else and you come up with an ordered sequence. And finally, this goal seeking system needs to have some way of associating uh, your progress uh, and trying to reduce the difference between uh, where, where you are and where you're going. So it's kind of an optimization framework. I wouldn't go as far as to say that I know which kind of optimization framework it is yet, but it certainly has to be one of those. So uh, I have not been keeping track of time. Christian, I thank you very much for letting me just continue, but this is my last slide. Uh, so for the why of attentional control uh, in my title, uh, what we've shown is a single effective algorithm is unlikely. Intractability is well demonstrated for most in, uh, interesting problems. And what that tells you is that you need, to be, you need to divide the space of all problem instances and solve these subspaces each differently. It won't be a single uh, algorithm. Uh, control is necessary to ensure rational behavior uh, because other possibilities are inadequate to represent how uh, cognition seems and uh, visual behavior seems to go. And our example of the same different experiment shows the large breadth of strategies and the dependencies on context that these algorithms have. As far as the how of attentional control, the same different problem shows that the data space is just too large to expect a satisfactory training population. It's just not going to be something that you can easily put together. Humans use sequences of simple actions to solve complex problems. That taxonomy of, uh, uh, of visual problems that I gave you, each one of those uh, plays a role within a sequence so that you just, you compose from simpler problems, uh, these sequences of complex um, uh, problems. You can represent them as cognitive programs, uh, an upgraded version of Ullman's visual routines. Uh, our star architecture is designed in order to embody these cognitive programs um, because selective tuning provides mechanisms to dynamically tune this single architecture so it, it plays many roles and will cast attention as optimization. I have to say most of the work is still ahead. Uh, there's an awful lot to do in order to realize this and to complete testing it. First of all, being we need to make sure that we have uh, solid results on the same different experiments so that our conclusions are valid. Uh, and then of course, you know, just building systems. I wanna thank uh, Yulia Kotsuruba, Marcus Solbach, Omar Abid, and Walter Kroina for uh, their work on all of this project. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was great and uh, quite prompt. Actually, you weren't close to running out of time. So we have some time for questions. Uh, the first one is from Andrea Stocko. He asks, uh, does adding your complexity level turn Mars uh, uh, level, the computational level into a rational analysis? Into a rational analysis? Hmm. I think I don't know the I don't know how to answer that question. I'm I'm not up on what rational analysis means in the way that it's being asked. If you can just repeat that, I can I can try. Well, maybe we'll 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 bring that up in the panel discussion since it obviously also ties to the other speakers. Uh, 
Uh, next one, uh, Keith Lambert was asking, wonder, I think that's related, if computational complexity can shed some light on this, or is it essentially a relabeling of the same problem, P versus MP? And I think that was generally in the context of your division of problems into, into sub-problems with specific solutions. It's, it's certainly not just an, uh, uh, you know, a variation of P equals MP. It's simply a realization that you act, that uh, the amount of, comp uh, of computing resources actually matters. Uh, you can take any problem that is uh, proven intractable to any degree you like, and with a small enough input, solve it completely. Uh, so that's not relevant. The point, and, and I think that the role of uh, GPUs and how common they, ha they be have become since uh, 2010 has been underestimated in uh, the machine learning community. Um, it means that they can actually solve problems that have some practical relevance now as using almost the same methods as they had before. And so it, I, I think that uh, what, you're as you're, what you're really asking is whether or not um, the complexity issue is relevant for practical systems today? I think maybe not because there's, as we've seen with DeepMind StarCraft, you can just throw 200 years of simulated uh, game playing at it and it's great. But I think that that's still not going to be enough to shed light on how the brain is doing it because the brain does not have a, a limit, uh, uh, sorry, an unlimited uh, set of resources. Uh, there are time constraints and it has to solve things differently uh, than that. So I think it plays much greater role with respect to how we want to compare these uh, kinds of systems to what the brain might actually be doing. Since you invoked uh, DeepMind StarCraft, uh, Andrea asked, uh, he's curious now whether cognitive programs can be learned through RL2. Slightly tongue in cheek, but so is that, for example, what the Mu Zero architecture does when playing Atari? So um, we're working on our own learning method for cognitive programs. It's quite different than existing ones. And uh, if I, do I have a minute? Uh, you do have a minute. Okay, so I think one of, because I'm interested in, in, in the, the connection to the brain, uh, you have to ask the question about what, how is learning actually proceeding in the brain? Uh, so you do, it is not what Turing had said in 1950, that the brain is blank and then we just load it up. Uh, it is what we've learned since then is that the uh, uh, the neurophysiology and the neuroanatomy changes from birth onto you know up to maybe 20 years old before you have full functionality in the visual system. It takes up, up your face perception does not fully mature until you're 20 years old. We did an experiment for the suppressive surround, uh, top-down attentional suppressive surround in our model and found that it does not mature in, uh, in humans until you're 18 years old. So you have to ask the question then exactly what's going on because the underlying structure is changing as you are learning. So you have, I think this is a very different sort of learning. Um, and that's what we're looking at for cognitive programs is to be able to learn it from a minimal structure that then uh, improves uh, with time and with learning. Whether or not any other system is doing that, I don't, I don't believe so. I don't think that that's the case. <laughs>